Yes. So uh, this is joint work with Petros Prineas and Christos Boutsidis. But before um, I start, I'd like to say a little bit about Nick. So in um, June of 1986, I was visiting Ian Duff at, at uh, Harwell Laboratory. And Nick was kind enough to invite me to Manchester. And he was a most gracious, considerate, and thoughtful host. And at lunch, he took me to the faculty club, which at that time had a fully stocked bar right as you came in on the, on the right. And the first thing Nick did without hesitation was to uh, offer to buy me a martini or two or three before my talk. Um, I politely declined, but maybe I shouldn't have. So move on 10 years and um, we are in Toulouse where uh, Surfax has its linear algebra year and on the occasion put on a workshop on eigenvalues and beyond. And I remember, I think the talks took place in that lecture theater and, and Francoise and I were sitting, Francoise was working on the QR algorithm and we were sitting outside the theater on, on a bench and she asked me something about QR and I thought Nick would be in a much better position to answer. So I introduced her to Nick and the uh, rest is history. So I am taking credit for that. I introduced them, my greatest mathematical achievement ever. <laughs> if you know Nick, you know that he's a connoisseur of, of fountain pens. And if you write with a fountain pen, then the departmental issue stock paper just doesn't do because the ink just bleeds and feathers. So you need fountain pen friendly paper. And Nick has been extremely generous on giving me advice and sharing his new uh, uh, types of paper with me. And one is uh, Tomo River. It's a Japanese paper manufacturer that, that makes really acid-free, very smooth paper for fountain pens. And then there's a company, Maruman, um, which makes notebooks, also fountain pen friendly. And it named it um, uh, one of the most popular lines after the Greek goddess of memory. And um, OK, so Nick is probably going to disagree with me on that. But if you've ever written with a gold nib, you don't go back to a steel nib in a fountain pen. And there is an the company Platinum, which makes an affordable line of fountain pens with a, with a variety of fine 14 karat gold nibs. And so I'm uh, really uh, grateful to Nick for all his very generous advice. And um, if I were in Manchester now, I'd see the new collection of his pens and all this. So I'm, I'm, I'm missing a lot of things here. So also, um, if you know, Nick's books are, are sprinkled with quotes. So uh, when I have to look up something, which is a lot, I invariably happen upon a quote and then I read the quote and I read the next one and the next one and the next one and then distraction happens. So here are a few memorable ones I like. Uh, in 1924, one Mrs. Latouche, whoever that was, professed to hate sums because if you add numbers up from top to bottom, you get a different result than when you add them up from bottom to top. And therefore arithmetic couldn't possibly be a science. I don't know how Nick found these quotes. I know it, he, he uh, cites the math Mathematical Gazette, but it's just amazing how he comes up with these quotes. Then this one works well if you're in front of a class of befuddled and stressed calculus students. Minus times minus is plus. The reason for this we need not discuss. Here's one from Cleve from more than 50 years ago, which is still valid to a great extent today. Almost anything you can do with a inverse can be done without it. And one last one, uh, which is due to Wilkinson and my favorite one. The two main classes of rounding errors are not, as my audience might imagine, backwards and forwards, but rather one's own and other people's. One's own is, of course, a model of lucidity that of others mm, serves only to obscure the essential simplicity of the matter in hand. I, I, totally, I totally agree. Probably Nick will too. Okay. Let's go on to business. So I would like to give a very brief talk about uh, conditioning of matrices in lower precision. We'll give a deterministic explanation, a probabilistic uh, explanation. And if there's time, I just talk a little bit about context. So here's the problem. So we have a matrix, uh, 128 by 64, um, and it's in double precision. Its condition number is 10 to the 17. It's numerically ranked efficient. In single precision, its condition number is drastically better, 10 to the 7. And in, the, in single precision, the matrix is, is moderately conditioned. So what we are, we are getting our matrix here from a particular context. So we are um, preconditioning these squares problems and the preconditioners are randomized and constructed with uniform sampling. And this is a best case preconditioner. So we have here a lot of the singular values are one and a bunch of them are 10 to the minus 16 in single precision, uh, in double precision. And in single precision, they are just 10 to the minus eight. So uh, question is, why is the single precision version much better conditioned? 
Well, the large singular values more or less remain the same in eyeball norm, and the small singular values when you devote the matrix to single position in increase. And that was already observed by Stewart and Son in their book. So here, what, what happens? So if we store matrix, we uh, commit a, a floating point error. In double position, it's 10 to the minus 16. When we demote the matrix to, to, to single position, we make an error of 10 to the minus eight. So here's the deterministic view of why this happens. We know singular values are well conditioned. So if we take the singular values of the perturbed matrix and compare the corresponding singular values of the original matrix, then the two of them differ by no more than the norm of the perturbation. This is true for all the singular values. So the large singular values in our case are one. And if you commit a perturbation of 10 to the minus eight, they don't change, at least not in eyeball norm, because uh, here we are interested more in magnitude than in uh, getting seven or 16 accurate digits. However, when we're talking about small singular values, things are inconclusive because a small singular value, if it's 10 to the minus 16, it's way smaller than the perturbation we are inflicting. So this lower bound here is negative and it's inconclusive. Okay, so what to do? Why well, we are inspired by work of Stuart, the elder and the younger. Uh, but we improved their results uh, a little bit. So let's suppose we have our original matrix singular value decomposition with uh, left and right orthogonal singular vectors. We have a cluster of large singular values and one single small singular value. We perturb this matrix. So, and then we, we represent again the perturbed matrix in the uh, singular vector basis of the original matrix. So here you see the perturbation. So everything is non-zero now. Let's assume that the large singular values here are, are larger than 10 times the perturbation, all of them, and that we have one small singular value that's on the order of the perturbation squared. Then we can show a second order expression. It's valid to second order. That the squared, why do we have the squared singular value? Because we convert everything to an eigenvalue problem. The squared perturbed singular value, the smallest one, is equal to this expression. This expression contains elements of the error matrix uh, squared. So this is positive and we have, we have squared. So that means for the original singular value, unsquaring gives us a perturbation of order epsilon. Uh, the improvement compared to um, the other results are that we have only positive terms here. We don't have a negative term. So what is the interpretation? So the interpretation is we model the motion to single position as a perturbation of order 10 to the minus eight. Well, the result is two for, for any norm of E. Um, we assume that the matrix has one small singular value on the order of uh, norm of E squared, which is 10 to the minus 16. All singular values, all others are large, larger than 10 times E, which is larger than 10 to the minus seven. Then to second order, the small singular value increases to 10 to the minus eight. Okay, however, what if you have more than one small singular value? And we don't, um, E does not represent a component-wise perturbation. It's just a generic of the shelf perturbation. So then we take a probabilistic view. This is all ongoing work, nothing is final. Okay, so there's a lot of probabilistic analysis and random matrices. Um, and you know, Jim and Alan have worked on that. However, unfortunately, many of the results are um, too fuzzy and the assumptions are impractical in particular, um, the many of the results require a, a matrix that's, uh, whose expectation is zero mean. Our perturbation has zero mean, but the perturbed matrix doesn't. And I was just going to give you one of the fancier newer results. So it's a matrix churn of concentration inequality. I'll just give you this, and then I'll tell you where, why it is not applicable. Suppose we have a bundle of square matrices xk, n by n square matrices. They are symmetric positive definite. And then we, we sum them up. And uh, so the sum is again a random matrix and we want to know how about its smallest eigenvalue. And we want to know how does its smallest eigenvalue compare to the smallest eigenvalue of its expectation. However, we can only query whether this small singular value of the random matrix is less than or equal to the small singular or eigenvalue of the, of the expectation. We cannot query how much larger it can be. And there's already you know, we need to know the other way around. How much larger can it be? Furthermore, this is a probability. This is a bound on the probability. The first factor in the bound is n. n is the dimension of the matrix. 
And so this thing for all practical purposes and all of my experiments, the probability, the failure probability is always one because of this N here. So it's not useful. Although we have used this bound before, but in this context, it's not useful. So here we are uh, starting with a more single-minded approach. In reality, this is our matrix when promoted, when demoted to single precision. So we'll inflict a perturbation epsilon, which is of order 10 to the minus eight. So we model this as a component-wise Hadamard product. So if you look at individual matrix element, the perturbation here is the matrix element times epsilon, which is the single precision round of error, times a, a random uh, variable, which is uniformly distributed in minus one, one. And so from a matrix point of view, this is a, a Hadamard product of A with epsilon, and then this random matrix omega. And all the elements of omega are IID, independently distributed, identically distributed. And that, that perturbation models the singular values well. So in blue, are the, sing are the singular values of the uh, single precision matrix. And in red are the singular values of the perturbations we just cooked up. And you see they're on top of each other. So magnitude wise, it's a good model of single precision behavior using this perturbation. Okay, so here, here's the result. It's um, sort of a little bit of a, of a letdown. We have a tall and skinny matrix. We have our perturbation, uh, which we model by a, a random matrix. And uh, so that corresponds to component-wise perturbations. And then we can show the following. We can show a result for the sum of all singular values squared. And you're going to ask, well, what is the point? You are interested in a small singular value. Now you're giving us a result that holds for the sum of all singular values. Well, okay, fine. Well, it's just a start. So for the sum of all squared singular values, perturbed singular values, we take the expectation. In expectation, that's equal to the sum of all the original singular value squared and a term on the order of epsilon squared. However, we have a particular situation here. We have two singular value clusters, one cluster of singular values that's about all of them one, and then a cluster of singular values that's small, 10 to the minus 16 in double precision, 10 to the minus 16 in single precision. Okay, so let's, let's exploit that situation. So let's suppose we have R singular values that are large and we sum the R of them squared. And as the numerical experiment suggests in expectation, the sum of these singular values is equal to the sum of the original R large singular values. I'm not saying that individual singular values are the same because some of them are larger, some of them are smaller, but the sum in expectation is equal to the sum of the original large singular values. So they will cancel out of the, of the previous expression. So with regard to the small singular values, we have a cluster of them. Well, let's define the average of those. And we're using the linearity of the expectation. So the average of these small singular values, you can think of that as the cluster center. So we have the average of the original small singular values and the perturbed small singular values. And then the result that I gave you before it, um, uh, implies that in expectation, the uh, perturbed singular value its, its cluster center is that of the original matrix plus an O of epsilon squared term. So again, here's an interpretation. So suppose, so I'm, I'm, this is just the previous slide in words. Suppose that we have R large singular values and we have a lot, a lot of large singular values compared to the matrix dimension. So only very few small ones. We uh, commit a perturbation on the order of epsilon. We hope that we assume that the norm of A is not too large. So it doesn't overwhelm over all our uh, epsilon square term. And then we have a, a very, very small singular value, a cluster of them. And this is its cluster center. So then for the small singular values, its cluster center in expectation increases compared to the original one by epsilon squared. We have epsilon squared here because we have the square of the singular values here. So then the issues are, is the cluster representative of individual singular values? What do we do to extend things to general singular values? And um, here is the one slide for the context. So what we are doing is we are doing preconditioning of these squares problems. We are constructing the preconditioner uh, in a randomized fashion by uniform sampling of rows with replacement in single precision. 
from an analysis point of view, the preconditioned matrix can be viewed as a sampled Hadamard matrix in the best case. So here is a Hadamard matrix. You construct it recursively. Then you normalize it to make it an orthogonal matrix. We take the leading end columns. And then from those leading end columns, we sampled C rows with replacement. So it's an oblivious sampling. We just pick um, rows of the identity matrix, C of them. And then here's a fudge factor because we didn't sample all the rows we have to make up for things. And sampling with replacement means you can sample a, a row more than once or twice or thrice. So this is our sampled Hadamard matrix. And of that, we plot the singular value distribution. So this is very short in a nutshell, the context. So. To recap, so our numerical experiments show that demoting a matrix to single precision can increase the small singular values. It's already been observed before, but we think we have a stronger explanation to show it. So we have a deterministic explanation where we give a second order expression for a single small singular value. And we have a probabilistic explanation where we uh, um, derive the expectation for a cluster of small singular values. And we have a lot more work to do. Happy birthday, Nick, and thank you from all of us for all the work you are doing in the community, especially for your books. I think uh, many of our careers uh, would have been ruined if it hadn't been for your books. Thank you for your attention.